When we talk about light as a wave, one of the most important properties it has is what's called linear superposition. And all that really means is we add two waves the simplest way possible. If I want to know the x and y coordinates of a product wave, that's the sum of two other waves, I just add those x and y coordinates, although usually we're talking about x and t. For example, if we have two waves like the red and the blue here, same amplitude, same frequency, <clears throat> but they're out of phase by half a cycle so that the blue is hitting the max while the red is hitting the min. If I add those together, they'll exactly cancel out and we get nothing. That would mean silence if we're talking about sound or darkness if we're talking about light. This is called destructive interference. What if we add the two waves and they are perfectly in phase? Now we get these, this combination that's twice the amplitude because we're just adding these directly. Notice if you look at the scale, the green peak here is two instead of one unit. This is called completely constructive interference. So if we were talking about sound, we'd get something loud here. If we were talking about light, we'd get a bright spot here. In general, we could have anything between the two limits of completely constructive and completely destructive. Here we have two sine waves, same amplitude, same frequency, but out of phase by about uh, a little bit more than a quarter of a wavelength. And what we notice here is we get a peak that is higher than either of the, of the individual waves, but it's not as high as it was for completely constructive interference. Here, the thing that's interesting, uh, you could figure out, you have access to Mathematica through the school, so you can download it for free, and you could figure out that what we're doing to create this graph is just plot the sine by itself in blue, the sine with this shift in radians of about 63 degrees in red, and then the sum of those two things in green. And we're plotting over the range 0 to 10 pi. So you could download this and change this to whatever numbers you want. <clears throat> we could also look at waves with different amplitudes and how they combine. We won't actually do that, but it's so easy to do it in Mathematica that we can look at it. Here the blue wave is regular size. The red wave is only 70% of that size and partially out of phase. And then for the sum, we get this thing, the green wave. We could also do this with different frequencies, which is another thing we won't worry about here, but... Here, the red wave is one and a half times the frequency of the blue wave. And you see when we put them together, sometimes the peaks line up and we get a very tall peak. And sometimes they don't, and we get almost a flat spot. So the position of these peaks here, the green ones, those are beat frequencies. And if you're tuning a piano, for example, you have a tuning fork and you hit the key that's supposed to produce the same note as the tuning fork, if they're not exactly in tune, you'll hear kind of a warble between them. So what can we do with this? A first example of interference that we're going to look at is called Young's double slit experiment. And the way it works, we have monochromatic light, which nowadays we'd get from a laser. It hits this very thin slit on this first screen. That makes this slit a source because we know about Huygens' principle and we know every point along that slit is now a spherical radiator. These other two slits are the ones we're really interested in. The purpose of this first slit is just to make sure the same light, that is same amplitude, same phase, same frequency, hits each slit. That's why it's positioned directly in between them. Now these two behave like spherical radiators, and here's where we can find interference. In some places, the waves overlap and we get constructive interference, or the bright lines. If the waves overlap in a destructive way, we get the dark lines. This, we can look at this from the side to try and figure out why this is happening. So this is our wave front. This is parallel beams coming in, illuminating the slits. Then when we go out here, we notice directly across from the point between the two slits, there the paths for the two slits, for the light rays from the two slits will be exactly the same length. They started out in phase, they travel the same distance, they're still in phase, and we get constructive interference. So you get the bright central spot here, known as the central maximum. If you move off to the side, for example, up this way, 
now we're a little closer to the top slit, a little further away from the bottom slit, so they have to travel different distances, and they will pick up different phases. They will no longer be in phase, and eventually that distance is so great that we get a dark spot. If we keep going, the distance increases even more, and we're back to bright spots. To figure this out mathematically, we can look at this from above or from the side and figure out, okay, we have these two slits. What is that extra distance traveled by, in this case, light from the lower slit? If we say they're separated by a distance d, and the idea here is d is not huge on the scale of a wavelength of light. It could be 10 times or maybe 100 times the wavelength of light, but it's not 10,000 times. We have the slit separation here. We call the point directly across from the center of the slits, which is where our central maximum is. We'd say that is theta equals zero. And as we move up the screen, we say we are increasing theta. If you look carefully at the geometry here, this angle theta is exactly the same as this angle theta in this new little triangle we've created. The hypotenuse is D, the slit distance, and this part here this side opposite theta is the extra distance that light from the bottom slit has to travel. If that happens to be exactly one wavelength, then when the rays meet up here, a distance x from the central maximum, if they're just one wavelength out of phase, that looks the same as in phase. For example, here on this picture that we started with, what if the blue wave had started 50 cycles before I plotted it, and the red wave had started 10 cycles before. It wouldn't make any difference. They're still in phase. They look exactly the same. If they're off by a whole number of wavelengths, they're equivalently not off at all. You can think of it as two analog clocks in the same room. If they say the same time, we don't really know which one started first. One of them could have started years before the other one. The only thing that we can see is the difference, the part of the difference that's less than 12 hours, that we could detect. We go back to our interference picture. If the path difference between two waves is a whole number of wavelengths, the waves are in phase, and we get a bright spot. If it's a half integral number of wavelengths, the waves are out of phase, and we get a dark spot. And honestly, we have to specify an odd half integral number, since eight half wavelengths would be four full wavelengths, and we'd be back to constructive. If we want to calculate this path difference in terms of things we can measure, here's our theta. This extra distance here is d times the sine of theta. If that extra distance d sine theta equals m lambda, and m is an integer, it could be positive or negative, we'll still get a solution. That would mean traditionally positive, we'd say, is above the, the line bisecting the slits, negative down here. But in any case, we would get this, and this will identify all the different places where we'll get a constructive interference, a maximum. If we wanted to find destructive interference, we could write it like this. The extra distance has to be m plus a half times lambda. What kind of test question could you get, or homework question? It could be something like this. A laser of wavelength lambda equals 630 nanometers, illuminates two slits 5.2 micrometers apart and 1.9 meters from a projection screen. What is the distance on the screen from the central maximum to the third minimum? So what we need to find is the angle to the third minimum. We find that from d sine theta equals m plus a half lambda. D is the 5.2 microns, which we can write as 5200 nanometers, so we're using the same units for light wavelength and slit separation. And here you notice I've set m equals 2. The reason is the first minimum would have m equals 0, the second would be m equals 1, so the third minimum is m equals 2. We have all the numbers we need, we solve this, do the math, and we get 17.6 degrees. We can now draw a right triangle where one side is this dotted line, one side is this dashed line, and one side is this x that we want to know about. We know theta, we know the distance to the screen, so it's pretty simple math to figure out what x is. And all we have to do is x is 1.9 meters times the tangent of our angle, and in this case we get 0.603 meters.